Hi, I'm Ben Chilton. I'm here at uh, DBS Bristol and I'm teaching a workshop on sound design using modular synthesizers and hardware. Hello. Um, my name's Ben. I run Elevator Sound, the synth shop on Stokescroft. Um, and I'm a bit of a m nerd for modular, um, to say the least. I do kind of bits of sound design work and composition freelance as well. Mainly kind of focusing around like hardware um, and kind of the ways you can create all sorts of kind of weird sounds with it. With way too much delay. There we go. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm assuming everyone kind of roughly knows what this is. For anyone who doesn't, it's a synth. <laughs> it just looks fancy because it's got nice bright colour cables. Um, on that note though, if I do say like anything that people don't understand, use any terminology that people don't understand, just like, you know, throw an orange at me or like, be like, what the hell are you talking about? Because it's going to be a lot easier for both of us and you're all going to get more out of this if you kind of get where I'm coming from. Um, so yeah, don't worry if I say something you don't get, just, um, you know, shout at me and be like, what the hell are you talking about, man? Cool. Um, so yeah, on a little bit more about what I do, I guess sound design wise, um, I'm going to take apart this patch that I've been working on for like two hours and <laughs> start, uh, start talking about what I do. So um, I, w I do kind of bits of commission sound design work and uh, lots of kind of what's called like pitching for things. So you get a brief in, someone says, I want 20 sounds of aliens for my new sci-fi film and I need them to sound big and scary and I want them to sound like no one, el no one else has aliens sound like before. Um, which is pretty typical, you know, everyone wants to sound unique. So from that point, you know, you kind of have to start conceptualizing, like, right, what am I, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna, gonna make these sounds? Um, there's kind of loads of different ways to do it, um, loads of different approaches, and kind of modular is great for this, hardware is great for this, because you can kind of push things a little bit further with any kind of software system. You're always limited by things like processing power, sample rate, etc. cetera. Um, whereas with kind of anything, uh, hardware based, especially kind of like analog hardware. Shit, there's Be able to kind of like do interesting things like this is just feeding a delay back into itself. literally just feeding a delay back into itself, speeding it up and a little bit of EQ. Um, but because it's a nice kind of analog delay, it means that when it starts clipping, when it starts breaking up, it doesn't sound crap. You don't get that horrible kind of like clicky um, distortion out of it. So, I mean, there's, would everyone like me to kind of roughly go through like how I put something together using this format or? Yeah, cool. So I basically written like a bunch, like five different points, and then we're like, I don't know which one to start with. So we'll start there. Um, I mean, a pretty kind of like typical sound um, that gets asked for a lot. Um, and for anyone who's been to the cinema in like the last four years, there's that kind of like trailer trope that you get at the moment where, you know, it'll be like a big action film or a monster film, and they'll be like, oh, they're invading. <laughs> and there'll be a massive sub drop and then like some really quiet dialogue and then another massive sub drop and you just repeat that like eight times and then you put the name of the film at the end and everyone goes, oh my God, it's Michael Bay. Um, I love it when that joke lands. So um, yeah, things like kind of like big sub drops and that, um, they're really kind of doable um, in software. You can get really kind of like clean, really interesting things in, uh, from kind of doing this in software. Um, stuff like, you know, creating sine waves and that works great in a computer because like, mathematically they're going to be perfect. They're not going to have any weird overtones or anything. Um, if you're doing it in hardware, it's a slightly different story. So let's... Cool. There we go. There we go. Nice, fun, 
exciting saw wave. Let's get some harmonics out of it. There we go. Um, so this is an oscillator. It just outputs sound. Um, obviously, it's not particularly subby at the moment. You can kind of tune that down a bit, give it a bit more welly. There we go. It's a bit more like it. Maybe a bit resonance on the filter just to bring it out. But got a nice kind of pretty subby tone there. Um, again, the, like this is all stuff that is kind of transferable into software, things like uh, Max, React Blocks, and like a lot of the Ableton synths now have kind of like, I guess kind of like at least loosely modular architecture. So you can assign, you know, LFOs and envelopes and modulation sources to different things. So this is all kind of stuff that's, that's going to be transferable. You don't need to go and buy loads of modular, but you should, because it's sick. Um, let's just check that that's in the right mode. It's not, there we go. Cool. Um, so obviously, you know, for a sub drop, you want it to drop. Um, for this, things like envelopes are great. It's just a kind of like single cycle, just waveform. Uh, in here, it's a voltage shape. In elsewhere, it's, you know, um, data. But we can run the signal. There we go. A really nice, super high envelope. There we go. So it needs a little bit of tweaking, to say the least. There's not really anything going on there that's useful. It's a pretty naff sub drop so far. Um, so this is where modular is great, um, that you can kind of effectively use anything to control anything else. You can split signals. You can route them to different places. So at the moment, we've just got our oscillator going straight into a low pass filter. You know, if you want a good sub drop to tail off, you need it to kind of like disappear away, so it's not just going to interrupt everything in the, else in the mix. Um, so the same envelope signal, which is being generated from down here. I don't know. Can everyone see everything all right yeah. from there? Cool. I'm going to try not to wave my giant jumper arm over everything. Boom. So it's already starting to sound a little bit better. So what I've done here is I'm taking the signal out into this little module called a multiple. It's just literally eight jacks just soldered together. You feed one signal in and you just get loads of outputs. Uh, one of these is going to our oscillator and giving us a pitch envelope. And the other one is going to our filter. Giving us a filter envelope. I might change the oscillator because it sounds a bit, this one sounds a bit weak. Oh, there we go. It's a bit more like it. Oh, lovely. There we go. So this one, this oscillator, I should mention, is digital. So it has lots of different waveforms in it. You can kind of kind of scrub through. But this one seems to be working quite nicely. Uh, so the, the envelope signal is being split into two inputs, one controlling the frequency of the oscillator, one controls the cutoff point of the filter, which means as your kind of oscillator drops away, what you're not left with is those weird, you know when something gets really low and kind of flaps the speaker, it kind of filters all of those out, so you'd be kind of getting rid of all the highs. But let's go back into this one. So, you know, we've got something there that's starting to be pretty usable, but, you know, it starts a little bit high. Ooh, and it doesn't quite, shh, there we go. Um, another thing you have built in here, again, kind of pretty common to find it in uh, software synths nowadays, um, something called attenuator, which allows you to effectively kind of shrink the level of signal that's getting to a certain parameter. So here we've got our oscillator is starting pretty high for a sub drop, unless it's one of those super long ones, which this is kind of turning out to be. You probably don't want it to go all the way down. Um, so this knob here is 
an attenuator for the input signal. So you can kind of hear it. That's a little bit more like it. There we go. Sounds a bit more like it. Cool. So we've got a relatively kind of functional sub drop. Um, now the bit where my kind of favourite bit, um, the bit that always kind of comes with, I think, kind of like a lot of a lot of sound design work, um, and you know any kind of like personal sound design is you're like, cool, I have a sub drop. You can download a million of those off the internet. Um, why it becomes interesting is actually being able to kind of make that your own in some way. Uh, one trick that I use quite a lot of is things like kind of feedback. So being able to take, let's say, where's this one coming from? There we go. Um, so these are all aux sends out of the desk, which will basically allow me to route any channel back into the case. Um, and we can use that, let's say, on the filter. So we've got two inputs that control the cut off of the filter. Nice. Cool. So currently that's aux 2. It's not sending to anything, but we can actually feed this signal back in. Um, and this is the kind of strong point of modulation. It's what's called audio rate modulation. So it allows you to kind of affect any parameter, but at thousands or tens of thousands of times a second. Um, it's doable in digital. It works, it works digitally. Um, it just doesn't sound that good. <laughs> um, I am biased, but there we go. And you start to get all these weird. So all these kind of little bits of feedback. And that's actually it just playing itself. What you can do from this is obviously just keep messing around with it. And it's where you kind of start finding stuff. You know, I've gone in to make a sub drop, but that's quite a good, you know, if we, just, can we speed it up a little? Let's put something else into it. Um, square waves. A little bit painful, but <laughs> you get the idea. So where, what you can do there is, so all that is is just running the output from the the kind of sound straight back in and rather than creating like an audio feedback loop like you would with a mic or a speaker um, or like we were doing with the delay which I've which feeds the audio output back into the audio input so you get this kind of chain what you're doing is taking the audio out and then using that to control something rather than feeding it back in. So it means you've got a lot more control over what exactly it does to the sound. We could put that in somewhere else. Um, say instead of using it to control the filter cutoff, we could use it to control the pitch of the oscillator. Let's see what that does. Ooh. Not a massive amount. Oh, that's why. weird bubbling sounds. So this is pretty good for, you know, anything earthquakey. Nice kind of super low sub rumble. And if I don't manage to balls up the gain staging. That'd be pretty good in a cinema. Don't want to rattle these off the wall. <laughs> 
Um, other thing worth noting is any you know good desk or good um, interface with decent preamps, you can redline the crap out of it. It doesn't matter too much. If you want something really clean, and maybe you wouldn't, but you know if you want it in kind of like big energy and power, then it's a really fun thing to do, and it's pretty rewarding. <laughs> There we go. Cool. Weird. Um, so that's what you kind of don't get as much with in kind of like working in the box. A lot of that, from my experience, tends to be like, right, I'm going to make a sound that sounds like this, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to carve it out. I'm going to create some source material, you know, some waves, some kind of, you know, atmospheres, and then you know, land them, take stuff away. And it's lots of kind of like tweaking. What you don't necessarily get as much is the kind of like playing element of being able to, you know, to set, we set this envelope up to run off of a sequencer, which is this little guy over here. Um, and let's get that to run a bit faster. And da -da 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 -da. So this is just going to output um, a kind of uh, a gate pulse, which is just a little burst of electricity. Mm. And effectively, it's just going to push that button for me. Bit slower. There we go. So that's now just going to kind of automatically keep re-triggering the same sound. And you can start to kind of play around with it. Play around with the tuning, uh, play around with some other kind of ways of, let's see, what have we got on here? Oh, we're using both filters. Nice. Um, so this is running into two filters effectively and splitting them. Got a high pass and a low pass. Take the output of one and use it to control the other one. Giving us a nice kind of clip. And you just sit and record, you know, a good, good while of that. Maybe change the envelope a bit. So a much kind of slower tail. And I don't know if everyone can kind of roughly see. All right, no one please laugh at me because I'm rubbish at using Ableton. Um, usually use Logic for sound design stuff um, just because I know all the shortcuts now. Cool, lovely. So what we can do is take an input from here. Um, the reason for the desk, obviously, as well as doing kind of feedback, these desks are great. It's a Soundcraft signature series, um, and they have built-in uh, audio interface for every channel. Well, they've got a built-in audio interface with an in and out for every channel, which means anything that I record into the computer, I can then route back out into the desk and use, you know, kind of feed that back into the modular. Um, and then the same for any recording stuff, I can record multiple channels separately. Um, so if we wanted a bit of that, uh, let's do another. I didn't buy enough of these fancy red cables and I regret it now. <laughs> They're already expensive. Cool, uh, where's the reverb? Let's do a reverb. Oh, didn't have to set those up. Nice. Cool. So if we wanted, say, a bit of a reverb tail on here, there is a reverb module we can quite handily patch in. And these are well new, so they don't call up properly. Da -da -da. There we go. So that is now auxiliary two output. We can center that and then delay on it. It's a 
fade out. There we go. So what we've now got is our reverb. Just on its own, kind of fire it away in the background. So we can record both channels of that separately, which is a very handy thing to do for any kind of sound design work. So let's just... Gonna be easier. There we go. So we can tweak them both. We can maybe have a play with feeding the reverb back into itself. So we're feeding it back into it, so if you can get these nice kind of swells. And we've then got those as, I oh, just checked, there we go, look at that. Look at those nice high res waveforms. Um, so we've now got those in here, and we can use those for layering. Um, that's really handy, because inevitably what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna, you know, make the best bunch of like big sub drop hits you've ever heard. Uh, you're gonna send them off, and then someone will go, "Oh, can we get that?" But with like less noise or less reverb tail or something. You go, "Oh, it was just, it was just one sound. I just like patched a big thing, or you know, recorded some output from stuff. Big chain of pedals. I just recorded it in as a stereo input, and it's just one file without any kind of layering." So is that is that one of those is um, with the reverb? Yeah, yeah, so if I solo that one, and it should be coming back out of the desk. There we go. So that is our reverb channel only. So this is just the reverb, this one. So that's quite nice. Or oh, what was this big subby one? That's nice. So we can zoom in. Let's just chop that, chop that one out. This one's quite good. Whoop. So let's chop that one out. And yeah, this is where you can kind of start layering things. So let's go in and find maybe a kind of good hit out of this top one. Something nice and kind of percussive maybe. Yeah, we've got a nice little kind of reverb tail. That's quite good as a, that's really nice as a bit of a kind of sub drop. You can take that out. Chuck that in there and kind of, let's have that coming in slightly early. I don't know if you can kind of see that as well on here, but if we run them together, you should get a little. So, you know, it's a kind of start of impact. You've got a nice big sub drop and there's some kind of atmospheres afterwards. Let me bring it back a bit. A little bit more, the tail's kind of quite long. There we go, that works. So, uh, we've got two there, and then maybe try and kind of have something slightly more impactful. So, something that kind of. Something that maybe kind of kicks in a little bit harder at the start. Um, let's have, what have we got? Let's maybe see if we can find a slightly harsher. Oh, there we go. It's quite nice. Um, it does quite handily have a drive setting on it. Ooh, there we go. So there is loads of noise <laughs> after this. We can get around that. Um, there is something called a VCA, which is kind of, you find a lot in modular, um, not so much uh, in kind of desktop synths or uh, kind of software. It's basically the shut up module. Um, it's in charge of kind of making silence between things. 
its voltage controlled attenuator and it just shrinks signals down with no input. So here, no sound. Sound. But what we don't have is that kind of constant rumble. Um, so the same envelope signal that's going to the filter cutoff and to the pitch of the oscillator is now also going into the VCA. And that means that every time that uh, voltage shape is generated, it's also kind of, as well as opening the filter up, bumping the pitch up, it's also opening up the VCA and kind of letting the sound pass through. So you've got a nice big angry kind of sound on that. So if we, let's just grab a bit of that. Whoop. Maybe a slightly quicker tail. There we go. So again, a nab one of those. Please no one rinse me for how rubbish I am with Ableton. <laughs> Okay, and then we should be able to... Oh, that's actually quite nice as a lead up. There we go. So, I'll fade that in and have it so it kind of peaks there. There we go. A bit of layering, a bit more sub, so we can add that. Whee! Add that on here. Again, it's a little bit noisy. So that can be recorded into here. And we can just record, you know, just a bunch of that. There we go. So we've got a bunch of sub there that we can then slap underneath. And let's just cut cut it from some point. Um, whoop. There we go. That's a pretty good point. So cut that from there. Bit of layering, and it should be ready to go. You can actually see. I don't know how well you can kind of see on there. We zoom in. Um, how much the wave actually slows down to the point where it's almost inaudible by the end of it. And that on there, add zoom in a bit more, there we go, so I have all those running together and we should have some sort of very classic kind of trailer big hit kind of sound but with some weird wobble with that kind of like nice metallic uh, reverb that just came from feeding this channel back into itself so you get these kind of like odd imperfections and things and again if you want that can then now be fed back so if we want another layer of reverb we can feed that back into there so let's record channel two which is the reverb channel and actually send that back out again da, 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 da. woof there we go that is a big big reverb cool um, da -da. There we go. So if we just add another track, there's a lot of tracks basically. <laughs> um, is one point. There we go. One of those, and let's record that back in. There we go. So we've got you know now another kind of final layer of reverb on there. And that one's written over that one. There we go. Whee! A little bit of latency, but that's easily fixed. It's because my computer is old and slow. And we should have. Little tail at the end, a little bit of noise that can kind of be trimmed off in post. Um, so that is one thing worth noting with the using any hardware, especially if you're kind of doing lots of layering, is there is going to be a little bit of noise present. Um, if you're doing really kind of super precise like sound design, especially for things like um, electronics or user interface or operating systems and things, sometimes they want it very, very clean. That's kind of easily, easily done now with 
things like RX um, or, or any kind of like cleaning software or just trimming everything and EQing it, good gain staging. Um, things like this, a little bit of noise can work really well to your advantage. Um, it can kind of smooth the whole sound over. You've got some kind of like um, frequencies that are pretty much present all the way across um, and they kind of like kind of tie everything together quite nicely especially with you know probably run that through a little bit of compression and get it sounding as loud as possible um anyone who makes dmb probably knows what i'm talking about um but yeah trying to kind of like get things to stand out a bit more um is always good did everyone kind of follow that <laughs> cool lots of nodding and looking at me and then looking at the screen um but yeah so with that, I guess, kind of in mind, um, it's important if you're doing kind of like sound design, especially for kind of films um, and games in particular, to really think about what it is that you're making a sound for and what time it exists in, what space it exists in, what's it made of. Um, things like um, weapons, it's a, you know, a pretty typical, um, one to go for but like weapons in games are really like um, a good example so all right yeah there's gun sounds and whatever but like you know jump forward to like all right someone's asked you to do a bunch of hits for a tank in a new halo game or something or um, some sort of like sci-fi gun thing that's made out of alien body parts what does that sound like it's not going to go bang it's not going to sound metallic because it's not made of that. So you have to kind of change your approach based on that. Um, you know, if you want something kind of squelchy, something weird, things like filters are a great way of kind of creating that. Um, let's do a little bit of that. Um, so a lot of it is, yeah, the approach to kind of what is this thing. Also for, again, kind of anything, I guess, kind of... Um, especially long, longer stuff and think things in um, kind of film and that. If you're designing, say, sounds for, um, uh, for, for anything that is, is more than a one shot, if it's something that appears a bunch of times um, or you're writing kind of to a moving image, what space is it in? Um, you know, if you've got, I don't know, a helicopter landing outside, you probably don't want a really tight slap back studio reverb or it's going to sound really weird. Um, in the same sense, if you've got, you know, say a really kind of like enclosed um, space, you probably don't want a, this massive kind of like sweeping the, the hills are alive or the sound of music kind of reverb on it. Um, so that's, a, that's an important thing to think about. And I think it really informs the way that you shape sound. Um, so if we do a bit of this. Where did that go? Um, these guys. And there we go. Um, so with the kind of squelchy idea in mind, let's see what we can get out of this. <laughs> kind of wobbly. Yeah, so that's a little bit quick. We can get it to sound a bit more bubbly, maybe kind of changing the waveform that's running into it. A good way to do that. Uh, let's try, where's the ring one? There we go. So again, it's a little bit more kind of bubbly. Where's that? That's why I'm using the wrong one. That's why. 
Wrong bloody oscillator. Ooh, actually, no oscillator works quite well for this. So with pretty much all filters, you can feed them back. They do this nice self-resonating thing. Um, some filters don't do it and they're rubbish because it's the coolest thing in the world. Um, and just with, say, doing that with the two different oscillators, and mixing them. There we go. So, another kind of like quick patch. Um, we have three low frequency oscillators or LFOs, which are exactly the same as this, but just they're designed to go slow. Um, there's actually nothing going into the filter. Both sides of the filter are self oscillating, which is a kind of handy thing that filters do. Um, we've taken the mix output straight out into the desk, and then we've got three lines running from the three different LFOs in. Um, these two are sine waves, so nice and let's swap those over. It's a bit easy to follow. There we go. So. There we go. Um, so these ones are all sine waves, so you know, nice and kind of smooth sounding. Even when they go really fast, you get this kind of like sound rather than anything kind of too harsh. So you can get all these kind of like nice bubbling sounds. Let's take a bit of a. Uh bit of spring reverb on it. Um, these LFOs are all being modulated by this tiny little thing over here, which is a random voltage generator. Um, you feed it a trigger signal, and you can kind of see down there, but the lights change color. Is that this little guy? Yeah, you can see him changing color. Um, red is negative, green is positive voltages, and these are speeding up and slowing down these three LFOs um, all together but completely randomly. So what you end up with is... kind of weird R2-D2 noises. But record... Record a bunch of that, and because it's random, it's never going to repeat. So you could go and get a coffee, whatever, come back, and you'll have 20 minutes of really random weird bleeps. Um, there's still another output from this that we can use. Um, and in fact, we can split that again and start just kind of experimenting with it and sending it to different places. So we've got Let's try feeding it into the, this side of the filter. So rather than... So I've just brought all the attenuators down. So rather than controlling an LFO and speeding and slowing that up, it's just controlling the cutoff of the filter. So you get almost a kind of... the BBC Radiophonic sound. What else have we got that we can put in here? Maybe some crossfader. So there's a crossfader between the two filters. You can see that kind of light going a bit mad at the top. It's now going to kind of ping between two sides. If we wanted, um, we can get that in stereo, I think. Yeah, let's try that. Everyone likes a bit of stereo. Left. Right. Sounds kind of stereo-esque. Uh, 
There we go. Cool. So we've got that. And then we've still got one more. That is quite grating after a while. <laughs> uh, you can send it to say a pitch input on the other side. So we've now got some kind of patterns. You know, someone's going, all right, yeah, we really want just like a classic like bleeping computer system for we're going to remake Tron for like a third time. <laughs> so you've got that, but we've now also got all of our LFOs here, but just all shrunk to zero. And we can start to blend those back in and get some kind of some kind of gliding sounds. These are all still running at a pretty kind of low rate as well. So they're going to give us all these kind of weird glides. Between things, but we can speed them up and run them kind of closer to audio rate. And you know, you have the modem dial up. Sound. All the way into weird, super high frequency noise. So yeah, nice bit of, for anyone who remembers dial-up. Um, I've been trying to forget about it for like 10 years, but it will never go away. Um, so again, being able to take something pretty standard, like a filter, and then modulate the crap out of it in loads of different ways, using things like kind of random voltages, um, which is more traditionally known as sample and hold. Um, here it does literally sample um, like a noise chip uh, and then just holds the, the frequency uh, or the, the voltage that's coming out of that at that exact sample moment. <coughs> Uh, it's slightly different in digital systems. I think there's, uh, there are things that are really, really good at it. I think the Ableton sample and holds awesome. Um, not sponsored by Ableton, um, but it is really good. So, and that, again, because you're not limited by things like cables, you can route that to everything if you wanted to. Um, that's where stuff like Maximus P comes in really handy, um, being able to design you know, like a small little thing and just root it to absolutely everything. Um, there's, and with things like kind of the, the multiple and being able to split signals, means you can time everything to change, say like, you know, at the start of a bar. If we wanted at the start of every bar, loads of things to kind of randomize, um, then we can, we can set that up kind of really easily, which also kind of plays into the whole, you know, being able to just let it run and just, you know it's going to run in time, you know it's just going to keep giving you new things on you know, the first beat of every bar and you can just go in and kind of like play with the knobs. Um, I know, I don't know if there's any features for it in Ableton yet, but there's a really good one in Logic which allows you to strip silence for things, which means you can just record like a hit at the start of every bar, mess around with the knobs, get as many weird sounds as you want and then um, you just go in, strip silence, and you're just left with 200, 300 completely unique samples that you can layer um, with you know, either kind of pre-existing sounds or you can then use those as jumping off points um, either for you know, sound design for your own productions or for kind of commissioned work, which is handy. Ah, uh, oh, it's just called strip silence, I think. <laughs> you right, you right click. Yeah, you right click on the audio file and then it says strip silence. There's a key command for it, but I can't actually remember it. My fingers remember it, but my brain doesn't. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, this case is designed, um, was designed to kind of be a like kind of studio sound design synth um, and also something to play live. This is basically all I've got. Um, this case, this um, mixer and my drum machine um, and like some pedals I bought when I was like 16 and like banging to death metal, um, which is still great. Um, but that's that's kind of all I've got. Um, so this this was designed to be really really multifunctional. Um, so it's a two voice um, synth. So you've got two oscillators. Uh, one is yeah, this kind of nice digital one. which has got loads of different waveforms in it. 
including some kind of percussive stuff. Some pretty kind of chaotic stuff. Um, I'm actually thinking of selling this, so if anyone wants to buy a braids, hit me up. Um, there's this, which is actually the first module I ever bought. Um, and it is a filth machine. So, I do an awful lot of sound design just with this. Just lots of layering, lots of modulation. It's great with, you know, a bit of... Bit of kind of reverb on it. Uh, it sings. Uh, it's a digital oscillator. It's basically two oscillators that you can kind of use to cross modulate each other with various different algorithms. I don't understand how it works. Um, I bought it on a whim because if you go on this company's called Noise Engineering, if you go on their website, um, there's a quote from a guy called Surgeon who some people might know. Um, he's a bit of a legend, to say the least, um, in techno, and it literally just said, I could fucking kill people with this thing. So I was like, cool, need one of those, um, and it has not let me down. I've had it for like four years. It's the best thing in the world. Um, the Laquelica Terratas. All of the noise engineering stuff has weird semi-Latin names, which is sometimes annoying, um, but it makes you sound very fancy when people ask you what you're using, which I like. Um, so with oscillators in kind of modular format, uh, as long as they're receiving power, they will just output sound. You know, I have no way of silencing it about creating kind of rests or space between notes. Uh, this is great if you're making drone music, but basically terrible if you're trying to do anything else. Uh, that's where this guy comes in. Um, very kind of satanic looking module. Um, this is the VCA that I patched in earlier. It's just six VCAs cascading. It's quite good because they're all squeezed in. Um, and then you've got some out at the bottom so you can take everything out at once. And it's got a weird hexagram on it, which is cool. Because, um, you know, rock and roll. Um, the little multiple next to it, which is signal splitter, um, continuing the theme of really evil stuff. Uh, this module is called the Plague Bearer. Um, and it's a distortion, which is very good at kind of pretty much just completely decimating stuff. And gives you lots of kind of like, yeah, really nice high gain feedback. I usually run a mic through that live and it just feeds back all the time, which is great. Uh, two filters, one for each voice. Uh, and then this is kind of mostly effects, but I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, this bottom bit is a sequencer. So a kind of four output uh, gate and CV sequencer. So you can use it for pitch and rhythm. Uh, next to it, one called the voltage block, which is probably one of my favorites. Um, it's eight sequences, but you can kind of play it. And you can see the LEDs pinging off, but it will effectively remember whatever you play into it. So which means if you've got, say, an oscillator going in, woo, we can patch something into it. So you can kind of get it, there we go. You can kind of play stuff into it, which is great for live use. Or with, without the sequencer running into it, it's really good as like a kind of a macro controller. You can split obviously all the outputs and you can just use these to control things but rather than having to go around and tweak knobs, you've just got one module there with eight outs. You can kind of use for tuning things and finding sweet spots and like that. You can also use it to almost like a preset. 
saver, um, which is handy. Uh, two envelopes on sliders. Um, there's a lot of sliders on the bottom. I like sliders. Um, it's good. It gives you a very good visual representation of what something is doing. Uh, so yeah, two envelopes that are manually triggerable. Very handy for doing, you know, kind of like hits um, and kind of like percussive sound design. You can just sit and go ding rather than having to, you know, set a clock up and get it to loop. And maybe if you want one to be a bit longer, you can just kind of do it manually. Um, it does also hold, which is great um, for doing kind of droney stuff. Allophone module next to it, which is for low frequency oscillators. Again, these just kind of like create a bunch of shapes, but it's got lots of outs, which is very handy. This is really boring. <laughs> um, this is an attenuverter, um, and it just lets you shrink or flip signals. So you can take, you know, a positive envelope and then flip it and use it to turn things down. Um, I'll get over to this one in a minute. Really nice reverb um, designed by a guy called Tom Herb, who runs Soundhack. I don't know if anyone's got any of the Soundhack plugins. They're free, they're from like 2003, but they're like the best plugins in the world still. Um, he's a genius. He did a talk on designing this module that is well interesting if you like kind of coding or just like general um, design of things. Random generator, this little kind of like sample player, which is the one I built, which only works 50% of the time because I built it. Uh, big, noisy, dirty delay that we were using earlier. This is a granular processor. Um, it's a little bit dated now, um, so it kind of aliases quite hard. Um, it's a module called Clouds, which is a very kind of like one of the famous modules, um, but it's just a mini shrunk down version of it. Um, Emily, who designs um, and is Mutable Instruments, who make Clouds, uh, does everything as open source because um, she's wonderful. Uh, so after you know the main version got released lots of people make mini versions of these um it's not as playable which is one of the really nice things about clouds it's got nice big knobs on it but it's quite handy to have a like granular processor you can use for looping again that gets loads of vocals run through it live little mixer inputs and outputs um which now that i've got the desk back i'll probably get rid of uh, and then this is a box of dirt which is a distortion which is really weird um, and it does, I'm not entirely sure how it works still, um, but if we stick a, stick a drum into it and see what it does, let's see what sound can we get out of you, that kind of sound. There we go. So it's a nice kind of classic overdrive. Um, and it uses the dirt to ground um, the signal and then does some weird processing stuff. Um, but you can do fun things like ground it through yourself, which is pretty cool. It's quite fun because if you put these both in your mouth, you can taste the sound. Um, there is one thing worth noting with modular, there's like a 10 volt range. So sometimes if you take a really, really hot signal and out, you put it in your mouth, it goes on your tongue. Um, it's a good way of testing things before you plug them in. Um, but yeah, that's my case. Very kind of quick run through. But yeah, it's two voices to be used, kind of lots of sliders and lots of kind of functionality for quick, um, like entry for things for using live, but then also lots of kind of ways that I can cross modulate things and affect things um, for, you know, in the studio and for, for doing kind of like sound design work. Um, can you um, uh, like use like a keyboard with it, like if you like plug in MIDI? Uh, yeah, well, so there isn't a MIDI in on in this case at the moment. Yeah. I've got a little box, uh, a little external box, which is a MIDI to CV converter. And that's how I use the Electribe to sequence everything. So the Electribe's got like a kind of keyboard style sequencer in it. Uh, that then runs MIDI into the box. That then takes your MIDI information and translates it into voltage. So um, it kind of depends on like what oscillator you're using, because some, some of them have like MIDI input. 
yeah, yeah. So some some oscillators now have a MIDI input. Um, not a massive amount, but quite a few do, especially some of the ones that are. So this is kind of a um, like a broken down voice. So you've got in the same way that with a synth voice you have an oscillator, a VCA, an envelope, a filter. Um, here you've got that, but they're all separate. You can get modules which are just standalone voices, which are just a whole thing in one, um, which are great ways of getting started. Um, and also really, really good for kind of live stuff. Some of those have MIDI input, so you can just yeah. bash a MIDI cable into it and go straight from there. Um, but otherwise, there are loads of modules that do MIDI to CV converting. Um, and there's also quite a lot of things that will do it just straight off USB now. Uh, there's a really good company called Expert Sleepers who do um, a bunch of modules that are basically just designed for hooking this up straight to a computer. They do interfaces. They've got one called the FH2, which is a USB host. So you can just plug like any bog standard cheap USB MIDI keyboard into it, and it will just translate the output of that straight to CV, and you can just use that. You know, you're like 20 quid weird. MIDI keyboard that you got when you were like 12 for making tunes. You can just bang that straight in and it'll work. Um, so that's the nice thing with this kind of, there's been a bit of a boom in modular over the last few years, which is obviously great if you own a modular shop. Um, I don't own the modular shop, I just work there. Um, but you know, it's great that more people are getting into it. And what that also means is that it's a lot easier to like interface stuff and to include things. It used to be, if you wanted you know, to use modular for making music, you'd have to have like massive walls of it and you know, all, all modules only did one thing. If you wanted 12 LFOs, you'd have to buy 12 LFO modules. Um, whereas now it's getting a lot smaller and also we're starting to see more people kind of building very specific things for things like those interfaces. You can have like a little case that's just got some mad you know, effects in it and some weird oscillators, things like the, the Teratas, you can just smack that in a case, have that, you know, get an interface or a way of linking that straight to your computer. Ableton have CV tools now, which just lets you kind of directly interface Ableton with modular, if you've got a kind of module to do the um, translating, but it's really easy now it's really, really easy and you can do, you know, you can, I think we, we see quite a lot of people coming in and just having like little cases for little things. Um, you know, like effects processing, weird, just I want a weird drum machine, uh, some synths for things, some stuff for kind of like processing, just modulation for like recording in, just getting some really unusual, completely random, never repeating modulation on things you can do really easily. Um, and it's nice having the hands-on approach, being able to go, oh, I want to turn this oscillate, this you know, frequency up. There we go, cool, that's done. Okay, maybe down, yeah, down a bit. And just being able to kind of tweak stuff. Um, and yeah, finding all those weird sweet spots um, and the weird bits where things start to kind of crumble and fall apart or where they get, you know, they process too fast and then they kind of bug out completely. And that's all, that's the point when you need to be recording because sometimes you won't actually be able to get those things back again. Are there any questions about sound design -y stuff or? I was going to say, what would like your, your advice be for a beginner? Like what to buy, what not to buy? What to buy, what not to buy? Yeah. Um, come into the shop and buy all the synths. <laughs> That's my advice. And then you will, you will be the best sound designer in the world. Um, I think maybe not necessarily. Um, I think every, like everyone has such a different approach to it. Um, the thing that I'm quite grateful for is it's being, you know, being able to have this equipment um, after, you know, this, this is just all my student loan money from when I was a student, basically. Um, uh, so what this gives me is a very particular way of going about things, which means that if, you know, someone gets in contact and they're like, right, I want big, mad, distorted, crazy, filtered, sweeping, booming sounds, that's perfect, I can do that. Someone hits me up and they're like, oh, I really want a nice piano medley for like, you know, the intro to my indie film. I, no, sorry. <laughs> I did try and do that for a film recently and it bombed horribly. Um, and then after a while I had to just be kind of like, I don't know how to play piano, I'm really sorry. Um, but f as, as far as actually kind of what to get, get something that works for you. If working in the box is is your way of doing it, if you kind of really like that flow of like sculpting sounds from scratch, then, you know, dive in at that, find, you know, you know, um, processes that kind of set you apart from everyone else. 
things like you know in the box that can be like saving channel strips that can be f like digging out weird old vsts from some like weird freeware site that does nuts aliasing stuff that just gives you all these weird alien spectral tones um uh, or, or work, things like working with found sound and Foley can be really, really rewarding for that because they give you all these kind of odd frequencies that you wouldn't find elsewhere. Um, if it's hardware, look at, you know, if you're going to buy a synth, look at something that's got loads of capabilities, um, something that you can really like, kind of take the sound apart if you're, you know, doing that kind of sound design. If you're doing more composition stuff for something that sounds great and, and kind of like, pour your time into it, you know, build your own patches, learn the whole thing inside out. I think that'd be the main thing for like, and like the main bit of advice I'd have to give is like whatever you have, whatever your pro current process is, like fall in love with it, learn it inside out, learn everything it does, everything you can possibly do with it. Um, because I've, I've, you know, fallen victim a million times to just being like, I need to buy this because this will make my sound better or this will do it and actually not spend the time with what I've got. So, and I guess the other the other thing would be, you know, if you see something cool, just buy it. <laughs> if you look at sort of, if you hear something or you hear a demo or something, you're like, that sounds amazing, you know, then 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 go for it. You know, the worst that will happen is you don't like it and you can sell it on. If you're starting to like wanting to slowly build up the modular synths, I guess you could also, you could just start with um, the not not having like a like. Definitely, yeah, yeah. So things like, you know, kind of like small purpose-built systems like that, are great. Um, you know, if you if you just want to do some weird processing, then yeah, you can just kind of start with that. Um, like I said, this was the first thing I bought. I didn't have anything else. I just had an oscillator. So all I made was drone music for six months. <laughs> Um, and then lots of like sampling it into Ableton and then trying to cut the waveform and trying to like use that in a sequence. It was, it was, it was terrible. It sounded really bad. But you know, you can, you can start, start with kind of anywhere really. Um, start with something that, I think it definitely helps to start with something usable. So yeah, effects, maybe some drums or maybe like a small synth voice or something, a small cheap synth voice that you can at least kind of get something out that you can work with. Otherwise, you just end up with a box that you're kind of like, oh, I've got to save like 200 quid before I can actually use this. <laughs> Some of the kind of pros and cons that I've come up with against for using kind of hardware um, versus software. I've done entirely software-based sound design. I've done entirely hardware-based sound design. Wouldn't recommend either of them. Um, <laughs> it's best to, you know, having a combination of the two is great. Having the kind of like sonic capabilities and the hands-on approach that you get from hardware, um, but also with the kind of like super precise editing um, and ability to recall stuff you get with software is really good. A um, couple of, yeah, good things. Yeah, like I said, getting a kind of unique sound out of hardware, you might have a keyboard that's got like a broken voice chip, but because of that, it makes this like nuts crackle every time you play a note, sweet. That's a unique sound. Record that. Make the most of it. Um, don't put it on everything, but you know, really kind of like dive into that sound and kind of tear it apart. Um, the ability to kind of like feed stuff back. Uh, things like no CPU overload. I could use everything in this case to modulate everything else, and none of it would fail. Um, and you know, you can do, do tiny tweaks here, and it doesn't have to be computing thousands of times a second. Um, this isn't so much a problem nowadays because laptops are pretty powerful now um, but it is an issue you can face especially if you're doing really really in-depth sound design you've got you know 200 not maybe not 200 but you know like 20 plugins and effects and you've got buses and everything going off and there's things rooting back you can run into problems by that point um, issue with doing hardware uh, recalls and edits can be difficult if you've not organized everything properly uh, what I mean by that is you send off a big you know nice kind of like spacey lush paddy thing for a film and they go yeah this is really good but can we get it in e minor or can we get that tail bit that comes in that needs to be 45 seconds instead of 51 seconds and you go ah oh, crap it's, ju it's just me playing keys i've got no way of uh, i can't can't do that whereas if you've got things that you know like we did here recorded in and layered you can move things around etc um and also naming 
Um, I didn't do that on here because it's boring to watch someone name files, but it is super important if you're going to be recording external um, external things, even things like Foley. In fact, just even if you're doing kind of like sound design and um, purely in software and in the box, make sure you name everything because there will be a point when someone's like, I need this in, in an hour. I need you to turn this around in an hour. And you're like, oh, God, which one of the 200 kick drum files is it? And you go through and listen to all of them. Um, naming stuff and also kind of saving projects incrementally so you know if you're doing big trailer hit you know number one have big trailer hit number 1.2 no reverb big trailer hit number 1.3 slightly longer tail every edit you make don't overwrite the original keep those projects kind of as they are because it will come to a point when you get further down the line they go oh actually we liked revision number six we're just going to go with that and you go well i've saved over it so sorry it's gone i can't change it now so having everything backtrackable is super handy it does take up a bit of space but let's whack it on an external hard drive or something they're kind of pretty cheap nowadays uh space we live in bristol rent is mad expensive you're going to be pretty lucky to have like a big room somewhere that you can use uh, that is one thing that's kind of notable about um using hardware is like it does help to have a bit of space you can do it you know everyone's done the kind of like crampy living in a like tiny room trying to make tunes um but it is handy to have space um maybe don't uh just something worth kind of um room kind of bearing in mind I guess. Um, and yeah, the cost thing. Um, lots of people always like to ask me how much money this cost me. Um, like I said, it's basically all I own. I don't own any software. I got Ableton a long time ago. Um, but you know, if you kind of roughly equate the cost of buying kind of hardware and then looking at maybe kind of like similar within, you know, kind of the software realm, the price isn't that madly different. Um, and you know, if that's if that's kind of something you're concerned about, there are always ways around it. Um, there are studios available for hire. Um, we're in the process of setting one up at the moment, uh, which is all kind of like vintage synths. Uh, you don't have to spend you know hundreds of pounds buying you know stuff if there's somewhere that you can borrow them. I know DBS here have tons of good kit, um, and I'm sure they would be more than happy for you to borrow it big plug for DBS <laughs> um, that's kind of it really um, but yeah done do your thing tell people about it <laughs> um, you know like it's um, and as much as I think I think it might just be my working style but I've always kind of preferred like kind of quantity of material um, at least source material over quality, so making lots of sounds and then mining those sounds for the best bits personally for me works. I don't like carving stuff from scratch, um, but everyone has a different approach um, and go find someone that likes what you do and then do it really well for them and then someone else will probably hear about it and be like, here's some money, do that for me too. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and say that that will happen right away because it doesn't all, all the time. But, you know, sometimes it does. Cool. I think that's a wrap. <laughs> that's my workshop. Thanks for watching. For more uh, information and related videos, you can subscribe to DBS Music. <laughs>